Once again, good morning. Let's stand together and let's turn in our Bibles this morning to the Gospel according to Luke chapter 19. We'll look to continue our series in Colossians next week, but um, something on my heart for this morning as we begin the new year. Also, as we're finding our way there, just a reminder that Sunday night, 6 o'clock, we go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and currently studying the gospel according to Luke, and each of you are invited. We pick things up in Luke chapter 19 at verse 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, as they heard these things, he, that is Jesus, spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas uh, minas, and uh, said to them, do business till I come. But his uh, citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money uh, to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And then came the first saying, Master, your mina has uh, earned 10 minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. And likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. And then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept uh, put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you're an austere man. You collect what you do not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not at least put my money in the bank that at my, co- at my coming I might have at least collected uh, the interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 minas. And they said to him, master, he has 10 minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and uh, slay them uh, before me. Uh, Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning and the fact that we have some place to turn to in all of the world and build our lives upon something that is going to outlive the heavens and the earth. We thank you for this instruction to us today from the mouth of our Savior, and we pray that the, the instruction, the comfort, the encouragement of this passage would find a needed place, a wonderful place, a fruitful place in each one of our hearts. And we ask for this work of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I know that uh, as I listened last week to the sermons that uh, Pastor Mark and Pastor Tom taught, that they kind of closed out uh, 2020 and uh, introduced 2021 in their own uh, way with uh, wonderful uh, uh, message and and encouragement. And I I always pray each year at the beginning of the year because it's such a wonderful reference point. Do you want me to say anything in particular, Lord? And usually he doesn't. And, uh, but this week, my heart was directed to, I felt in verse 13, just uh, 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 five verses that are there in the uh, New King James where the master says, do business till I come. Uh, uh, And that's what we want to look at today. And I I like it in the old King James, maybe because that's how I read it as a new Christian, but I really like the verbiage of it as well, where Jesus instructs us, occupy until I come. 
course, uh, the year 2020 has been a year that has absolutely been dominated uh, day and night, right to left, every which way you want to look at it, uh, with COVID-19. And all of the health damage that's been done as a result of the virus and all of the economic damage that has taken place, not only in the United States, but in the entire world. And then in the United States, we had a presidential election in which the two candidates could not have offered two uh, more different uh, uh, futures in terms of a vision for the country uh, than they did. And then to say nothing of the civil unrest in our cities this year, uh, the burning and looting of stores and buildings and uh, mayors, uh, allowing the insurrectionists to cause, uh, worst of all, an uh, open season upon law enforcement before our very eyes. And then to say nothing of how this uh, pandemic emboldened many, many government officials to um, exercise their authority uh, beyond what has ever been done for in the history of the United States under similar circumstances, and in some cases at the expense of the civil liberties of individuals that are guaranteed by the Constitution. And all of this to say nothing of the continued moral and spiritual slide of our nation and of our world. In 2020, the latest statistics that we have for uh, death by COVID um, however much we can trust statistics today in this regard, but it's estimated that 1.8 million people have died of COVID in this last year. And uh, a tragedy that has gotten 24-7 news coverage this year, as we might expect. But the greatest cause of death in the world today hardly got a mention when a record 42.7 million unborn babies were killed in the womb by way of abortion. And, uh, and the silent Holocaust goes on, and uh, for all of the uh, angst and all of the uh, uh, getting everyone to mask up and the whole world mobilizing for six feet and then Operation Lightspeed for a vaccine and how everything became front and center in order to deal uh, with COVID, there was nothing comparable that was done in the face of the loss of 42.7 million uh, children uh, in, in the world. And I think it would be a very bad guess to think that heaven looks as casually upon uh, that in this world as we do. And these and many other things, of course, uh, made 2020 a very hard, a very frightening, and in some respects, a very, very maddening uh, year for many. And I think probably for most people, as it was viewed uh, for the most part through the lens of the natural eye or processed through the lens or uh, through uh, the, the uh, natural mind. But from the vantage point of, of biblical prophecy, the end, end time scenario that's laid out uh, in the scriptures, the Bible's description of what the world will be like immediately prior to what the Bible refers to as the rapture of the church and then followed by a seven year tribulation period and then also uh, the, be, beyond that, uh, followed by Jesus' second uh, uh, coming, that all of that scenario continues to move forward, uh, though largely unnoticed uh, or without the slightest concern about it uh, by the world. But it has marched forth uh, steadily and dramatically forward in the year uh, 2020. Ezekiel's uh, latter-day prophecy in chapters 38 and 39, written over 2,500 years ago, concerning what will be the geopolitical condition 
uh, of the Middle East in the last days, uh, immediately before uh, there is this attempted invasion of Israel by Russia, Iran, Turkey, and other uh, uh, Muslim-dominated nations. All of that sits largely, if not now, completely uh, developed and fulfilled before our very eyes today, like never before in human history, including the birth of the nation of Israel in order to be attacked uh, within, within the prophecy. And it's all of it just awaiting the match that will light the fuse, that will blow things up and then cause that entire progression to move forward. And that match could be Israel's attack upon Iran's nuclear facilities, for uh, example. And uh, the whole world is aware of the fact that Iran has threatened uh, not only to gain nuclear weapons, but that its uh, central concern in developing it is to destroy Israel, uh, to bring to an end the nation of Israel and to reclaim the land of Israel. And whatever the mindset is concerning these kind of things from one generation to another in the United States of America, they take this kind of thing really, really seriously in Israel. And no generation wants to live with the legacy that they let something happen that then one day caused the annihilation of their children or their grandchildren. And so the world has, uh, Israel has warned the entire world that they will not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons, whatever is required of them to bring that, uh, uh, for that not to uh, develop. And when will Israel do it? We don't know when they'll do it, but they could do it at any time as as the nuclear program is in uh, full bloom there in Iran and becoming more dangerous by the day in terms of its development for weaponry. And maybe Israel will endeavor uh, that invasion and spark that whole invasion uh, of, uh, of Ezekiel 38 and 39, while our current president is still in office who is so supportive of Israel. Or maybe they will do it all on their own when another uh, 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 administration uh, takes, uh, uh, takes office and, uh, and forced to do it on their own. But anything could light that fuse at any time. It sits just waiting. Uh, Europe and the European Union continues to move uh, in its, uh, uh, behind its formation was the desire that they would have the economic clout in the world that would be required by uh, a unity of these nations and in this desire for economic clout and economic kind of oomph within uh, the world to become one of the main players. 2020 has been another year for them in which it's two steps forward and then two steps back as they are uh, waiting, biblically waiting, for a very charismatic, very capable and skilled and talented leader to lead them into world prominence during the tribulation period. And that leader, of course, will be the Antichrist. The immoral signs of the last days as the Bible uh, describes them are advancing, not by the year, not by the month, but literally by the hour today in our nation and in the world. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. He said, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, check, lovers of money, check, Boasters, check. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers. Uh, And of course, the uh, social media has taken that to a place we've never known in human history. Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Check, check, and check. And anyone can see that the entire world is rapidly moving away, not only from the God of the Bible, but moving away from the instruction 
of the Bible itself, the teaching of God uh, and the commandments of God that God knows are required in order to keep an entire world of fallen human beings, an entire world uh, of sinners operating cooperatively and, and productively and knowing that the degree to which any nation or the degree to which a world moves away from the commandments of that God uh, that uh, then is the degree to which it will unravel and first morally always and then physically. In the United States of America and in lots of parts of the world, there is in this entire phase of things, this idea of creating entirely new morality that is contrary to the morality of the God of the Bible. And so the moving to reject that morality and then the idea that there won't be physical consequences for this. And we're in the honeymoon. We're in the, in the bubble phase of this that uh, we can change that morality and it won't change our lives. It won't change our interactions. It won't change the quality of life or the stability of life within the world. And yet, even now we see in the early stages of that attempt uh, since, uh, uh, you know, uh, half a century ago to disband and get rid of uh, God's morality, we see the consequences rapidly coming upon us on a physical level. You cannot reject morality and God's commandments in that realm and not have it ultimately come in and then pay the price physically as well. At the core of virtually all of the problems in the world is the moral decay of human beings. And no matter how uh, much we might become a nation or a world of blame shifters, and, uh, and looking for excuses for everything without taking responsibility for it. We can hardly blame uh, the panda bears uh, or, or, uh, or kangaroos for the situation and the condition that we find the world in uh, today. The spiritual condition of the world continues to decline rapidly as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writing again to Timothy said, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And so this departure from the faith speaks of those Christians who apostatize from Christianity. And uh, they were Christians at one time, they apostatized from it, raised in Christian homes, and, uh, and, and they turn uh, a, a, away from it, and they uh, at one time embraced Christianity, now departed from it, and there's always plenty of that going on, but never more in my experience than is happening today. But it also includes those who claim to be Christians and uh, identify as Christians, but they apostatize, as Paul said, from the faith, uh, from Christianity as it's, as it's defined in the scriptures. And so there is this departing, uh, depart uh, from, uh, they, they depart from the, the Bible as the standard for doctrine and practice, and uh, what we believe and how we live and the idea that somehow I'm free to redefine Christianity and identify as a Christian and yet uh, reject what the Bible teaches concerning what a Christian is. And the Apostle Paul, he declared uh, this spiritual characteristic of the last days to be demonic in its origin. It is, uh, it, it, the cause of it is a genuine uh, demonic deception. And it results, he says, in a seared conscience, a Christian who is able to speak lives, uh, lies and live a life of hypocrisy. In other words, to live a life that is utterly inconsistent with the teaching of the Word of God and then uh, fully convince themselves that somehow this is acceptable uh, in the eyes uh, of God. Again, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, Paul declared in this realm of uh, what the world will be like spiritually in the last days. He said it will have a form of godliness, but deny its power, and from such people turn away. 
In Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8, uh, is the beginning of what is known as Jesus' Olivet Discourse. Uh, it is the second largest of, longest of his sermons, second to the Sermon on the Mount. And it's called the Olivet Discourse because he delivered it on the night before he was crucified uh, at, on the Mount of Olives. And in that uh, the, uh, 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 Olivet Discourse, he teaches the disciples concerning what he refers to as the end of the age including uh, the signs of the world prior to the rapture and then what the world will be like during the tribulation period and then his second coming. And, uh, and he listed all of these things in that early part describing what the world will be like prior to the rapture of the church. He describes those things as birth pangs that will occur within the world. And he lists those birth pangs. And he begins by talking about, he began by talking about religious deception. He said, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and deceive many. And at the end of the age, as things get more and more difficult in the world, people get more and more desperate and they begin to turn to all kinds of things and all kinds of uh, teachings in order to uh, find some hope and it makes them uh, vulnerable to deception and, and religious uh, deceivers. And uh, it's interesting that Jesus begins as he lays this uh, list out of these birth pangs that he begins with this uh, religious deception. He's going to talk about uh, earthquakes. He's going to talk about plagues. He's going to talk about hunger and famine. But he starts there with the false teachers. And the reason that he does is as horrible as plague and as horrible as, as hunger and disease is, those things, the consequences are temporal. To be spiritually deceived, the consequences of that are eternal. And so he begins there. And so he moves on in, in his description there of, of these birth pangs. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. He goes further and says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against uh, kingdom. And this describes not only uh, nations that are identified by borders and armies fighting one another, but now you're going to have uh, segments within a society, within a nation that will begin uh, to uh, fight uh, with one another, and the government will not be able to gain the upper hand related to that. And this kind of thing fills the world uh, today. And uh, groups of people fighting also who don't represent a nation. They represent their militia. They represent their uh, ideology. And like the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or terrorists or, or the drug cartels. There's one expert uh, on these things stated that the future of the world will be characterized by, and I quote, warrior societies operating at a time of unprecedented uh, resource scarcity and planetary overcrowding. I don't know, uh, I can't speak at all, and the Bible doesn't, to planetary overcrowding uh, or to, uh, to resource scarcity except for food that will take place. But it is true, and what he says is in line with what Jesus says when he says warrior societies operating at a time, uh, at, at such a time. He went on in the article to say, henceforth the map of the world will never be static. This future map, in a sense, the last map, and he's writing not as a Christian, the last map will be an ever mutating representation of chaos. So Jesus said that in the last days, uh, the world will be one of widespread instability geopolitically, and we see it. If you are my age, you remember when it was a standoff in the Cold War between the United States and between uh, Russia. And then now with the decline, and for a lot of different reasons, and how, however great or marginal the decline is in terms of 
uh, the United States and a fear of the United States declining in the world or whatever emboldening of other nations. There's a, the, the world has uh, been thrown wide open and emboldened a lot of people to try to do uh, a, a lot of different things and there's a lot of st- instability in the world in this regard. Jesus spoke of famine. He spoke of pestilence and disease, whether it's new diseases like um, uh, SARS or whether uh, COVID-19 or HIV relatively new or talking about the emergence now of uh, drug resistance diseases that have been uh, put in the rear view mirror in, in man's history, at least in, in the Western world. He talked about earthquakes in various places. And essentially, Jesus is telling us that as the rapture of the church in the following tribulation period uh, nears, things are going to get worse and worse and begin to seriously unravel uh, on every level in the world. It will begin to fragment and to destabilize spiritually, politically, materially, and physically. And it will do so in a frightening way. And a person can agree with that or not uh, agree with that, but uh, the trends look like they're toward uh, what uh, Jesus uh, has said, the level of instability. I happen to be a news uh, junkie, um, and uh, it's a relatively safe addiction but, uh, that I'm always trying to break myself of. But I watch in all of my adult life, watching uh, a lot of the decisions that get made uh, in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and then to see uh, the absolute uh, blind uh, rush for power and, uh, and, and the creating of more problems and more problems and more problems and not realizing that they're in a position to fix problems. Because you have to fix your problems because the next batch of problems are always coming in life. And so I see our country, which was a, uh, a not only Uh, relatively stable in its own regard, but brought a larger influence of stability for all of its sins and imperfections uh, to the world. And and this instability that is all, uh, all around us increasingly in this day. And yet in the midst of that, as Jesus uh, taught the disciples in Matthew chapter 24, he said a curious thing to them, He speaks in verses 4 through 8, and in verse 6, he declares to the disciples, to us, he said, see that you're not troubled. Now, the the word troubled there in the Greek, it could equally be translated alarmed or disturbed or startled or terrified. And of course, that raises the question, how in the world can a person live in a world that looks like the one that you've just described and not be uh, terrified? And the answer to that question is, it goes back to what Jesus introduced all of these things as, and that is as birth pangs. And so in a physical birth, when a child is born, there are birth pangs involved in that process. We call them contractions. And uh, Jesus isn't saying that these things that he's described here will happen in the end days uh, for the first time in human history. Uh, When a baby is delivered, the contractions become stronger and stronger, and they become more and more frequent. He is saying these characteristics uh, of the world will become more and more frequent, and they will become stronger and stronger. And, uh, and, and, the, and, 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 and that, that is the, the use of, of the, the, the birth pangs. And Jesus is also declaring to the disciples and to us that even as, and I take this as a man, I've heard this, uh, people say this, women say this, and, uh, but w- uh, for all of the contractions that are involved in the birth of a child, that those contractions are relatively soon forgotten over the celebration of the birth of the child as the child is then laid uh, at the mother's breast. 
And uh, in the same way, these contractions that are going on uh, in the world as we see them, we don't see them as something that's just independent, bad things that are just happening in the world at the time that we're living, but that all of this is a part of giving birth to something wonderful, giving birth to the kingdom of God, and ultimately uh, ending in Jesus' second coming and establishing his kingdom uh, and kingdom age for a thousand years and a, a time of peace and prosperity and, and uh, calm and, and, uh, and blessing at, uh, at that time. And uh, so Jesus was just, uh, that all of this is the way that all of this is going to come, uh, come about. His kingdom is going to be burned, uh, birthed through these kind of uh, birth pangs, and it will be worth the birth pangs when it happens. But while all of this is unfolding uh, in real time, all around us as uh, Christians, there can be the temptation, of course, to be overwhelmed by all of these birth pangs and other prophecies, to be paralyzed by it, and to begin to think in the privacy of our own heart, or even to speak it out loud, that the problems are so big, so out of control uh, in the world, uh, politically, spiritually, morally, physically, from wars to civil wars, to food shortages, to disease, to terrorism, to crime, uh, to evil, to wickedness, that what can I do? What uh, am I to do? What difference can little old me make in the middle of all of this? And that is such a great question that Jesus answers that question in the parable of the ten minas, which we've just read. And it's a parable that's alternately known as the parable of the long journey, and that, that title may represent it better. You notice that in this uh, parable, as, as we read it earlier, the context of it is that a notorious tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus has, um, ex uh, how do I, would I put it? He's accepted Jesus' invitation to him to have Jesus come to his house. I don't know how all that, uh, that works, but that's exactly what happened. And, and Jesus agrees to come to his house for hospitality, despite the fact that he is hated and a notorious uh, sinner among, uh, among the Jews. The Jewish religious leaders who were hostile, very hostile to Jesus at this point, they then condemned him for allowing himself uh, to be a guest in the home of this kind of a sinner. And in the, in the course of Jesus' time in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus is, puts his faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, and then as an evidence of his, uh, his repentance as a tax collector, he vowed to re restore fourfold for any taxes that he had collected uh, un, uh, 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 illegally against the population. And that would have been a significant amount uh, of money. In response to the complaint of the Jewish religious leaders of uh, Zacchaeus' salvation, Jesus declared in verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And when he did, makes that declaration concerning himself, the Son of Man has come to the religious ear, uh, to the religious ear of the Jew, he had just declared himself once again to be the Messiah. Now Jesus, when he stops and he goes into the house of Zacchaeus, he is making his way now, at this time in his life and ministry, on his way to Jerusalem, from the area of Jericho to Jerusalem, where he is, upon this visit to Jerusalem, he is going to die on the cross for the sins of mankind and be buried and rise again on the third day. And as he resumes his journey from outside of Zacchaeus' house, this great crowd that is following him are following him with the expectation that he is now going to come to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover and that he is going to overthrow 
uh, the Roman government, and then he is going to establish God's kingdom uh, on the earth. That was the expectation. But Jesus knew something that the crowd didn't know. They could have known it from the Old Testament scriptures, but that, that crowd and their re- religious training in that, in that generation they were not fluent in, in what, what Jesus uh, knew in its fullness. And Jesus knew that the fullness of his work as the Messiah and the establishment of his kingdom would occur over two comings that he would come the first time as a suffering savior, as the scriptures, uh, prophecies declared, and that at his second coming, he would come as the king of kings and as the Lord of lords, as the conquering king. And all of it described in the Old Testament scriptures, uh, 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 both ends of the spectrum described uh, concerning the Messiah in the scriptures. And because uh, Jesus knew that there would be this considerable block of time, between his first coming and his second coming, and we're at 2,000 years and uh, counting, he spoke this parable in order to instruct us as his disciples concerning how we are to conduct ourselves as Christians between those two comings, that space between his first and second uh, coming, and uh, the very time that we live in now. The parable has three principal characters in it. First, there's the nobleman who leaves and he goes on a long journey. And that represents Jesus himself within the parable. And speaking of his return to heaven between his first and second comings uh, in order to receive a kingdom and then return, as is stated in verse 12. And then the second uh, group of characters uh, in the parable were the subjects who hated him, uh, uh, this this, uh, uh, ruler, this nobleman who hated him, uh, represent those who had rejected Jesus' claims as the Son of God, as the Messiah, and uh, among them the Jewish religious leaders. And then third, there were the 10 uh, of uh, servants who received the 10 minas from Jesus, and they represented the noblemen's servants. They represented uh, Christians, the the disciples of Jesus within the parable, and given the mina, told to occupy till I come, old King James, do business till I come, uh, new King James, which uh, 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 represents us as Christians, again, living between the two comings. Now, Amina was not an insignificant amount of money. It's not like, here's a quarter and try to go try to build an empire. Here's a quarter, go a dollar, and go try and uh, do something influential in the Roman Empire. Uh, Amina was somewhere between a quarter to a third of the annual salary of a laboring man. So in other words, it's enough to make a difference. He entrusts enough to these servants to make a difference and to be influential in some way uh, in in the world. Upon the master's return, uh, the master called each of his servants to give an account for the stewardship uh, that they had shown concerning the mina in his absence. And of course, the first comes and his, he has multiplied his mina to 10 and he is commended and rewarded for that. The second uh, is multiplied it to five and likewise he is commended and rewarded. And then uh, the, the third of the servants that is described for us here, uh, he comes with nothing but excuses that he makes uh, to the master and uh, and uh, none of which were accepted by the master. And this represents what's known as the Bema Seat of Christ, in which every Christian will one day stand before Jesus and we will give an account for our faithfulness uh, to his call upon our lives, his purposes for our lives, the mina that he has uh, put within our lives. It has nothing to do with our salvation. Nothing can touch the salvation that Christ has provided. But there will be uh, a judgment, a, a reward seat uh, associated with our Christian service. And then ultimately in the parable there in verse 27, all those who hated the nobleman, hated the uh, Jesus are uh, judged a- a- 
for their rejection of him at his second coming. Now, in order to understand this parable, it, it's very important to understand what the mina represents here uh, in the parable. Because uh, it, it, one mina was given to each of the Christians that are represented or the disciples within the parable. And because each one was given the same amount, each was given a single mina, uh, it cannot receive, represent natural talents that we have. It cannot even represent spiritual gifts that God gives to every Christian. Because while every Christian receives at least one spiritual gift, uh, to some people God will give uh, two, three, four spiritual gifts depending upon his call upon their life. And so that's represented in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25 and in the Olivet Discourse. This, is a, this parable is talking about something entirely uh, 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 different. What it, the mina has to represent something that every single Christian has equally, uh, that we have in common as a stewardship. And so what could that be? Well, certainly it includes the gospel. God's uh, invitation that, that, that he's given us to carry into the world, his invitation to man uh, for the forgiveness of sins and salvation and to enter into a relationship with him. We all have uh, that in common. And additionally, each of us has an individual calling from God, a specific will for our lives from God. Uh, within uh, some sphere of influence that he places us for uh, to be an influence for him, for his kingdom, for his uh, word. And there is, there is in, uh, in each of us in God's call upon our lives, there are aspects of his call upon our lives individually as Christians in which uh, there are aspects that are overlapping. We all, they, they, we all share those aspects that need to be faithful and so forth related to them. And, uh, and yet, there is also within this, uh, this gifting, this individual calling that is very unique to us individually. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, but he said, but as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Uh, very significantly, in this regard, the Apostle Paul declared at the end of his life, and the King James Version gets it absolutely correct when Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course. That's what it is in the Greek, not the course. Uh, I have uh, kept the faith. It is, I have finished my course. In the, in the Greek language, it is individual. Uh, the course is, and it is singular. And so it is concerning every single one of us as Christians. Where we come to the Lord in the course of our lives, and we have sought him in prayer concerning what his calling is on our lives, what his purpose is uh, for our lives, where does he want us to work, where does he want us to live, and all of these decisions that are in life, we've endeavored as best as we can to understand his will and to be in the middle of his will as best as we can, and then now uh, we go to work or we raise our families or we do what we do, and we live with this peace within our hearts with a sense that I am living exactly where and how God wants me uh, to live and how I am to spend uh, my uh, uh, life. And when Jesus calls us to occupy till I come or do business till I come, he is telling us, that in the same way that the businessman puts his money into circulation in order to then increase that uh, amount of money 
Each of us as Christians are to take the gospel, we are to take our gifting, we are to take our calling and uh, God's truth and put it into circulation in the world as well in our sphere of influence within the world, and that as we do, if that's all we have to do is not hide it in a napkin, if we do, it will bear fruit. Now, all that I've said for the last uh, 40 minutes, I have said in order to now say this. You say, boy, this guy has trouble getting to his point. Yes, it is a problem, you can pray for me. Again, the Bible teaches that as as the return of Jesus draws closer and and the rapture draws closer still, this world is going to begin to unravel on all fronts and not the least of which will be its headlong uh, rush into evil and its rejection of God. And that ultimately the problems in the world will become so great that man will not be able to solve them. There'll be no human solution for uh, the problems. Later in in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, uh, verse 25, Jesus describes uh, this time, this end times, as being distress of nations with perplexity. And the word distress means disaster, perplexity means no way out. And in the face of all of this as Christians, there's going to be a temptation to be overwhelmed by all of it, to be paralyzed uh, into inaction, and to think the problems are so big, they're so monumental, they're so national, they're so international, they're so global and out of my control that what difference can I make in the middle of it? And the parable tells us that's not your problem. That's not your problem. That's the nobleman's problem. That is God's problem. Our responsibility, and the whole point of the parable, our responsibility is to simply and individually occupy until I come, Jesus said. Occupy until he comes. And so has God called you to go to college? Then go to college and take the gospel and the word of God with you and the Holy Spirit. And someone might think, well, what if the rapture occurs during my sophomore year? Then he'll find you right where he wanted you to be. And he will reward you for being uh, faithful uh, to that. Has God called you to be a wife and a mother? Then be a wife and be a mother. And don't forget to take the gospel and the Holy Spirit with you into that calling. And and a person could say, but if the Lord's coming back so soon, shouldn't I go out into the mission field uh, somewhere? No, not unless that's his call for you. But if he's called you to marry and to raise godly children, then at the time of the rapture, he will find you right where he has called you to be, and he will reward you for being faithful. Has God called you to be a farmer or a business uh, owner? Then do that. But don't forget to bring uh, God's word and God's influence into uh, that calling to be a spiritual influence in that realm. And so often a person can think, whatever the occupation might be, you can fit yours in, but a person can think, well, if the Lord's return is so near, shouldn't I just quit the farm or or the business and do something more spiritual? For you, there isn't anything more spiritual. There is no calling more spiritual then whatever the calling is that God has called you to do. And so occupy until he comes, take care of the business for God's glory, and then at the time of the rapture, he will find you right where he wants you to be, and he'll reward you accordingly. And so it goes all the way through the list of all of the different hats and callings that we have uh, in, in our lives. And human history is not out of control. It is completely on course, but we cannot view it with a natural eye and come to that conclusion. 
but through the eyes of Scripture. And so Jesus says, don't be uh, troubled and, and, because trying to fix the world is God's job. It isn't our job. He just calls us to do the little thing that He has called us to do, to allow His call upon our lives to be in the big mix of what He's doing in the world. And then He promises that if we'll put that into circulation, if we will be faithful to it, then He will multiply it. He will make it influential and fruitful for His purposes. There's an old daily bread devotional that I read years ago and never forgot it, and it captures all of this perfectly. Allow me to close by reading it uh, to you. It said, uh, the, the devotional read, in the days before Connecticut became a state, the colonial legislature was in session when a thick darkness blotted out the skylight and a cry was heard. It's a day of judgment. Let's go home and get ready. But one member of the legislature, an old uh, church deacon, stood up and said, brethren, it may be the day of judgment. I don't know. The Lord may come, but when he does, I want him to find me at my post doing my duty up to the very last moment. Mr. Speaker, I move that candles be brought in that we may get on with the business of the colony. And as exactly as Jesus spoke in the parable of the talents in Matthew 24, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Occupy till I come is Jesus' word of instruction and word of encouragement and comfort to Christians in any age but especially to Christians who find themselves in the midst of a world that is described prophetically in the Scriptures at the end of the age, when the temptation will be to be overwhelmed by the sheer number and magnitude of the problems that are within the world, to become paralyzed by it, and to wonder the problems are so big, what difference can I make in the world in the middle of all of this? And what can I do to make a difference? And his answer to all of that is to occupy until I come. Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Jesus, we can trust you to make it simple. And we thank you that you do. We are great, at least I am, a great complicator of everything I put my mind to or my hands to. And Lord, this great tendency that some of us have to venture into what is your responsibility and take responsibilities onto ourselves that belong solely to you. And as the world continues to become exactly what you described that it would become, I pray and we pray that you you would use that simple uh, encouragement from your word, occupy till I come, to help us to leave what only you can take care of to you, and then, Lord, to focus on the simple, significant thing that you have called each of us individually to do. Thank you for this word. Thank you for the encouragement of it. And thank you, Lord, for um, what meaning and purpose and, uh, uh, that it, it brings, what perspective that it brings uh, to our lives in an hour such as this. And we thank you, Lord, in your name. In Jesus' name, amen.